You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. It's always a treat to have Rabbi Daniel J. Glassing with us, prolific author, writer, Rabbi of Congregation Kehillus Mordechai in the Five Towns, New York, and his book, Dealing with this time of year is called The Light and the Splendor, The Radiance and Inspiration of the Days of Triumph and Gratitude. Rabbi Glassing, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Hi, how are you, Zev? Happy Good, Sunday. thank you. I know you always have some great insight into the holidays, into the parshas. So tell us, so what is your major chiddush? What is your major thought about the Hanukkah holiday? <laughs> I know well, it's a lot so of yeah. there, there are so many important ideas. Well, I'll uh, share with you a question, and this question leads to many, many avenues. But, uh, you know, we know the story of Hanukkah, which is recorded in the Talmud, in Meseches Shabbos, in Tractate Shabbos. The Gemara tells us that they uh, they defiled, the Greeks defiled all the oil in the temple, and then when the Hashem came back and they searched for the oil, they found the oil, and the menorah lived for eight days. And the Gemara says, so they established Hanukkah, which, by the way, they did not establish it in year one. It says the next year they established Hanukkah, which is a very important point. But when they established it, Kava Om Va'asam, they established it as Yamim Toivim, as a holiday, Hallel to recite Hallel, Uva and to thank Hashem. And the Gemara does not say they established a mitzvah to light the menorah. <laughs> so you ask uh, a thousand Jews, what do you do on Hanukkah? You light the menorah, you light the Gemara. And the Gemara that records the episode of Hanukkah omits the mitzvah of lighting the menorah. And to me, that is one of the most important questions on Hanukkah. Why does the Gemara leave this out? Which leads some to say that they did not make a mitzvah to light the menorah originally. It did not come for another 200 years. <laughs> And, wow. and the reason for that is because the purpose of lighting the menorah is to commemorate the lighting of the menorah in the temple. But they had a temple for another 200 years. You know, no need to commemorate something that was still being performed. It was only after the destruction of the temple, then later on, they added an additional mitzvah. So that's one approach to that, Kamar, an interesting historical approach. Uh Actually, I, I was once discussing this with uh, Rabbi Herschel Schechter, and he said that he heard Rev Salvechik say over this approach, and he personally had a question on it because he he was at a museum that they found menorahs that dated back to the years in the immediate aftermath of Hanukkah. So clearly they did establish a mitzvah of lighting the menorah. But actually, if you look up the source, of this idea, the source of this idea is uh, one of the great Polish gedolim. His name was Rabbi Shuala Mikutna, and he says, "Yes, they did light the menorah in individual houses immediately after the miracle, but it was never legislated. It was not codified until the destruction of the temple." So that, that's one historic aspect. When did the mitzvah of the menorah? When did the rabbis enact it? But that goes um, against a lot what we learned in yeshivas and the tradition is that a year later when they saw that the miracle took place, the, the real miracle, the big miracle, of course, was also the war that a band of few was able to go against the many and succeed. And the year later is when they established the Yontav of Hanukkah. So how does that fit in? If they established the Yontav of Hanukkah, the only way to celebrate Hanukkah is lighting a menorah, not by well, eating Hanukkah. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's why the Gemara says the language of the Gemara is they established it the Hallel the Hoda. So they recited Hallel for eight days with a bracha, and they recited the Al Hanisim. But this this is uh, arguing that the lighting of the menorah per se did not come until after the destruction of the temple. But actually, in a way, it's a very beautiful idea because the the purpose of lighting the menorah it's just a continuation of of the lighting of the menorah in the temple. So actually that means that when we light our menorahs in our homes, we are performing the service of the temple and we become a a virtual high priest. We become a Kohen Gadol and our houses are transformed into the, the Beis HaMikdash itself because it's merely a, a continuity of the lighting of uh, the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash. <clears throat> 
There's another approach. Yeah. Let's do the other approach. Yeah. There's another interesting approach. And this is brought by Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach, where he says that the Gemara does say that you need to light the menorah, but the Gemara doesn't say it with the words that you would have expected. The Gemara says they establish Hanukkah, Behalel, to recite Halel, the Hoida, and to thank Hashem. What Hoida, thanking Hashem, means that refers to the mitzvah of lighting the menorah. The way with which we thank Hashem is by lighting the menorah. Lighting the menorah is an expression of gratitude. And based on that idea, that the word hoida, the word gratitude in the Gemara refers to the lighting of the menorah, Rav Shlomo Zalman advances that if somebody lit the menorah, but he forgot to think that it's an expression of gratitude, Rav Shlomo Zalman questions whether we're, we, one fulfills the mitzvah at all. And that would be different than any other mitzvah. Any other mitzvah, you do the mitzvah and your thoughts are certainly enhance the performance of the mitzvah, but they they are not critical to uh, whether you actually fulfill the mitzvah. And Rav Shlomo Zalman suggests that since the Gemara refers to the lining of the menorah with the word gratitude, if that gratitude is absent, then there's a question whether you actually fulfill the mitzvah. So this is just a simple analysis of the most important Gemara regarding the establishment of Hanukkah completely omits a mitzvah to light the menorah. So I saw from the Siva Shalom, but maybe we'll give an answer. He says the essence of Hanukkah is joy, simcha. And mm-hmm. he says, the proof is, is what did the Yavan and what did the Greeks try to eradicate from the Jewish people? Shabbos, Mila, and Chodesh. Shabbos is the circumcision and keeping the month. If you spell those letters, the first letter spells Shin Mem Ches, is Sameach, happiness. So therefore, the essence of Hanukkah is joy. So when the Gemara asks, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? Not asking, what is the holiday? What, what do we do for the holiday? He goes, what is the essence of the holiday? And oil is the essence of the holiday, because oil means joy, like Yehuda, my or to Jews, there was light. So that is just a reflection of what the essence of the holiday is all about. If that's the case, maybe that's why they didn't stress the lighting of the menorah. They just spoke about the essence of, of oil, which is joy. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a nice thought. Yeah, <clears throat> just just the thought uh, for my saw for him. It's a beautiful thought because the word sameach and joy, and certainly Hanukkah is a very joyous time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. In 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 your book, uh, you also have lots of different ideas about Hanukkah. What intrigues me very very much, so is the fact that Hanukkah is different from a lot of holidays. The stress is on the house, not on the individual. So. Therefore, maybe you can amplify that. Well, Purim, you need to have somebody qualified over Bar Mitzvah who can lay the Megillah, read the Megillah, in order to fulfill your obligation. But when it comes to Hanukkah, if somebody just lights a candle in your house, you've you've really done the basic part of the Mitzvah, of the commandment. Yeah, yeah, that's actually, that uh, discrepancy between Hanukkah and Purim really brings out the fundamental difference between the way these mitzvahs were enacted. So the, the mitzvah of reading the Megillah devolves uh, on the inv- individual. Everybody has to execute that obligation. And therefore, if you want to hear it from someone else, that person must be fully obligated in the mitzvah to discharge your mitzvah, as opposed to the lighting the menorah, where the mitzvah, as you mentioned, is on the house. And that makes uh, has many halachic ramifications. You know, if somebody is a guest, where technically they would not have to light themselves. They could do what the Gemara says. You give a few cents, you give a few, you give a dollar to the homeowner, and you have a partnership in their lighting of the menorah. Because once the house has a menorah, so everybody fulfills the mitzvah. So it's a very different kind of mitzvah. The mitzvah was obligated on the house. And uh, many years ago, I heard from a great, great rabbi in England, Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, who he said over from one of the Russia yeshiva and yeshiva called Taira, why is it fundamentally that the mitzvah of Hanukkah is on the house as opposed to the individual? And he cited a source in uh, Megillah Antiochus and in other ancient sources about the decrees of the Greeks, where one of the decrees was they decreed that no Jew could have a lock on their door, that they couldn't lock their doors. You know, we're familiar. They wanted to abolish 
Mila and Shabbos and Chodesh. But this is, I think, a, a new idea that many are not familiar with. They wanted to, they, they, they forbid a Jew to have a lock on their door. And the explanation was any home that you can't lock the door, there's no privacy in the home. There's no dignity in the home. The home has no honor. Basically, it was an assault on the Jewish house. It was an assault on the bias. They wanted to destroy the sanctity of the Jewish home. Therefore, when the sages enacted the lining of the menorah, they, it, it, they obligated the home in order to restore the sanctity, the dignity of the Jewish home. So it's th therefore, it's a yamtif that we have to celebrate the Kedusha of the Jewish home. You know, I once heard, um, and I've seen this inside, the Chassam Sofer writes, and by the way, Reb Levi Yitzchak of Ardichev also writes, we know the Talmud teaches us that when Mashiach comes, all the shuls, all the Batek Neosios will go to the land of Israel. They'll, they'll be adjunct to Eretz Yisrael. But there's an idea that the Jewish home will also go. The, the, the home where the Torah was observed, the mitzvahs were performed, the home also, the Jewish home has sanctity, just like a Beis HaKnesses. So that's one of the objectives of lighting the menorah to restore the sanctity of the Jewish home. I, I love the idea, and that's why you have the menorah opposite, opposite the mezuzah. Yeah. You're right about and, that. Yeah. Rabbi Daniel J. Glassian is our guest, a prolific writer. His fourth book is called The Light <laughs> and the Splendor, The Radiance Inspiration of the Days of Triumph and Gratitude, of course, also dealing with Hanukkah. What are some inspirational thoughts that you're able to share with us? Well, thank you very much. Um, one thought that I said over this past weekend, I had the zuchut to speak in Shari Tzion, one of the largest Syrian uh, Bate Knesios uh, in America. And I said over an idea that I find uh, very compelling and inspiring, where we have this discrepancy between the Gemara that talks about the miracle of the oil, and of course in the Alanisim, as you mentioned, we talk about the military victory. So, you know, how do these two miracles coincide? Are they two separate miracles? Are they yeah, how, how do we relate to the two of them? After all, you know, the miracle of the oil wasn't really needed. It was not really necessary. Um, you know, first of all, would have been the end of the world if we didn't light the menorah for seven days. Okay, certainly it would have been preferable. And But even more than that, we could have lit the menorah with impure oil. We could have lit the menorah with tame oil. We know there's a halachic principle that when the majority of the community is tame, is impure, then you're allowed to do the service in a state of impurity. So we didn't really need the miracle of the oil. And God doesn't perform miracles for nothing. So why did we need the miracle of the oil? And how does that fit together with the military victory? It's a, really a beautiful idea. When the Jewish people left Egypt, so God gives us a weather report. He says, Hayom atem ha'aviv. You're leaving today in the springtime. And the Medrash comments, look outside. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's not too sunny. The weather is just picture perfect. And the question is, of what relevance is it, what the weather was like when we left Egypt? The Jewish people were suffering for 210 years. It was like a, it was a holocaust. At least 2.4 2 million Jews were decimated in Egypt. They killed our babies. They put them in the cement. So if what, once we could get out of that mess, so we're going to run for our lives. Even if it's a rainy, cloudy, cold day, we'll be very happy we got out of there. I don't think a prisoner that was in prison for 50 years cares about what the weather is like on the day of his uh, liberation. So why is God focusing on the good weather of uh, the day we left Egypt? There's such good. a stunning, st stunning idea of Reb Chaim Shmulevitz. It's really beautiful. And, you know, this is the gift-giving season. We, we like to give gifts to our children. Actually, whether we like it or not, you know, that's something that we definitely, uh, hard to get away without doing. And, or you give your wife a gift. Imagine you want to give your wife a gift, so you pull out of your pocket a diamond ring and you slap it down on her hand. Here, here, here's the, here's the gift. She, she'll probably be very happy, but it's, 
missing something. What's it missing? It's missing presentation. You want to give a nice gift, it's better if you put it in a box, a silk box, and you put wrapping paper around it, and you tie a ribbon around it. Not that the box increases the retail value of the ring, and not that the bow or the wrapping paper increase the retail value of the gift, but it adds an intangible touch. It adds, it adds a touch of love. It shows you're not just giving it because you have to. You're giving it out of ahava. You're giving it out of love. Actually, for all you listeners out there, I'm going to save you some money because you could actually get a little bit of a cheaper gift, but if you present it right, you know, it goes, it goes a long way, even though it's not increasing the value of the gift. Uh, and it's the same thing when we left Egypt. God gave the Jewish people the greatest gift. He liberated us. He saved us. And the Jewish people, though, may have thought, okay, God saved us, but he has to save us. He's our father. He's our God. We were going to be destroyed. We would not have been, uh, there would be no remnant. So Hashem wanted to show, I didn't save you because I had to save you. I saved you because I love you. Look at the presentation. Look at this extra touch. Look at this intangible element. It's a beautiful day outside. I'm not just liberating you. I'm liberating you out of love. It's sort of an extra display of Ahava. So too, Rabbi Chaim Shalevit says, certainly the main miracle of Hanukkah, there's no question, was the military victory. Our lives were in danger. Judaism was in danger. They were going to destroy us. Yes, we could have abandoned our religion, but we weren't going to do that. So uh, the Jewish people were in peril. So we God had to give us the military success and help us win the war. But lest you think that God is doing it because we're his people and who else will keep the Torah and he, he's our father and he's our God, so he has to save us. So God says, you know what? I'm giving you the gift, but let me wrap it in wrapping paper. Let me put a bow around it. And the presentation of the gift of the military victory was with the miracle of the oil. The military, the, the miracle of the oil was a touch of love. It was wrapping paper. It was a bow. It was like a kiss from Hashem. And that's the greatest cause of celebration. That Hashem didn't do this because he had to. He did it out of love for us. Would you say it's similar to the fact that when Joseph Yosef was sent to Egypt in a caravan, that he was sent in a caravan full of fragrant spices as opposed to coil and oil, which is smelly, to God send him a message that, that I love you, that even though you're going through a hard time, would you say something similar to what you're saying now? Spot on. Reb Chaim Shulevitz uses that exact analogy in his piece. He quotes what you just mentioned by Yosef, that he asks, you know, Yosef is being kidnapped by hijackers, by terrorists. You think he cared what the terrorists smelled like? You know, his world is coming crashing down. And Reb Chaim says, hey, that's exactly the point. Lest Yosef think he's being abandoned and rejected by God, God is showing him a ray of light that I'm not abandoning you, but I'm, I'm coming down to Egypt with you. I'm going down to Egypt with you, and I still love you. I'm not, I'm not forsaking you. You have a plan. There's a plan. There's a purpose. There's a mission. And yeah, that's exactly how he interprets it. So Wow. No, it would make sense because it shows that sometimes you pay attention to little things convey big messages. And yeah, and that's yeah, what you're basically yeah. saying. Yeah. I'm always curious. I saw one original thought, and I didn't see it in your book, and I don't know if you're aware of it, that I think it's based on the Zohar of Jewish mystical teachings. Okay. It says that when Yaakov, when Jacob went back, to find a, a Pach Shem, and he went to get back a Pach, and we say there's a connection between the Pach, the, the jugs he went to get, but he left before he fought with the angel of Esau, and we say they found the Pach Shem, and they found the jug of oil, which is what the miracle of Hanukkah is all based about. Based on the Zohar, they say that this oil was from Noah. Noah, when he got the olive branch from the dove, he planted it, because uh, it came from Gan Eden is when the branch came from. He planted it, and he made oil, and he passed it on to Shem, and he sent it you know, to his son, which was also known as Malki Tzedek, you know, who's also known as, as the high priest, Melech Elyon. And that's what Yaakov went back to retrieve. And, and according to this mystical teachings, the Pach Shemin had the seal of the Kohen, Kohen Gadol was really referring to Shem. This was a special oil that came from 
paradise from Gan Eden, and that's why the miracle took place because it was able to last all this time. I, yeah. I don't, it's a beautiful thought that's based on mystical teachings. I just was, I, I was really intrigued by it, and I was wondering if you came across that and had any thoughts about that. Yeah, so that very good. That's um, that's attributed to a sefer called the Shach Al Hatora, which he was one of the students of the Arizal. Um, it's interesting that we find many connections between Yaakov Avinu and Hanukkah. Uh, most notably, we have a tradition Yaakov Avinu passed on 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 uh, the fifteenth day of Tishrei on Sukkot. And we're going to read in Parshas Vayechi, they embalmed him for 40 days, and then they cried for him an additional 30 days. So, and then that means that the 70 days of mourning for Yaakov were completed 70 days after Tesvav Tishrei. 70 days after Tesvav Tishrei is Hanukkah. So Yaakov died on, on Sukkot, but his Avelos was over on Hanukkah. And then they mourned him an additional seven days and then buried him, which means he was buried on the eighth day of Hanukkah. So we find a very uh, striking connection between Sukkot and Hanukkah and Yaakov's connection between the two of them. You know that in Parshas Emar, immediately after speaking about the umptif of Sukkot, it says, So we again, we see this juxtaposition of Sukkot and Hanukkah. Both of these are Yom and Tovim of eight days. Both, we say, a full Hallel. And we know the opinion of Beishamai is we uh, we light eight, seven, six, five, four, corresponding to the animals that were sacrificed on Sukkot. So there's a very strong parallel between these two holidays. And Yaakov is the one who links them as he passes away on, on Sukkot and he's buried on Hanukkah. Wow, wonderful thought. Before I let you go, you know, there's a the world asks lots of questions as why do we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days? Because they found enough oil to last for one night, and there are probably over a hundred different answers. But I did see a question raised is why don't we celebrate nine nights of Hanukkah? The opposite end of the spectrum, because in exile we have Sveik of the Yom, but we're not sure when Yantav uh. started. So I know that's a question that's been raised, and they give different answers. But according to the Minchas Chinuch, I saw something fascinating. He said in days gone by, they actually did celebrate nine days and nine nights of Hanukkah in far-flung communities. And he states when Mashiach comes, we'll have in certain far-flung communities, again, nine days and nine nights. Even though the chief rabbi of Haifa in the 1930s questioned, they have radios so people able to communicate. But I did notice that uh, that there was yeah. a thought that there were nine days and nine nights of Hanukkah. Yeah, I'll yeah. go with that, you know. Yeah, I, I can live with it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the night of Lachis and, uh, and Hanukkah lighting. Who can go bad? Any yeah. final thoughts you want to share with our audience? Well, uh, the Ramam tells us that the, the mitzvah of lighting the menorah is a very beloved mitzvah. And that's a description he doesn't use for any other mitzvah. And as mentioned, the purpose of lighting the menorah is a display of gratitude to Hashem which means that of all the things that we do, that which is most beloved to Hashem is when we when we say thank you, when we acknowledge what, what God does for us and when we thank Him. So with all of the different customs that were, are all very important, we, we have to keep our eye, eye on the ball and uh, the most fundamental focus of Hanukkah is, is to appreciate everything that Hashem does for us because you know, he restored all our Torah mitzvahs 2,000 years ago, but we're still going strong. And what a what a, a privilege it is for the Jewish people that we could continue to uh, fulfill the mitzvahs of Hashem and, and that Hashem gives us the recognition and understanding to appreciate what he does for us. So that, that certainly should be the focus of uh, Hanukkah. Rabbi Daniel J. Glossian, thank you for being with us. Uh, his book is called The Light and the Splendor, and it deals with, you know, Hanukkah primarily, but also deals with uh, Tuba Shvat as well. And what's your next book going to be about? We're working on a Haggadah now for Art Scroll, and uh, we have a couple months to get it, to get it together. <laughs> <laughs> I think after Hanukkah, the Pesach season begins officially, right? <laughs> That's right. But I have another book for you, Zev on Sefer Shemos in Hebrew, and uh, Bezos Hashem, uh, we'll get that over to you. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you back again, and Freilich Hanukkah.
Okay, Phil Santana, thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Clock Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast, the pulse beat of the Jewish community. For continuous Jewish programs, clocklinenetwork.com or our 24 hour a day listen line at 641 0389. For past shows, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Instagram, and all major podcast platforms or jewishpodcast.org. Thanks for listening to the talklinenetwork.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.